Hi, all. Welcome to everyone watching and listening online. We're uh, the Bell Shakespeare Company, live on stage at the, uh, the set of Romeo and Juliet, which is performing in the, uh, the Sydney Opera House. It's been going for about four weeks now. This is my wonderful cast. Say hello, cast. Hello. Uh, I'll introduce them in a second. I'm Damien, the director of the show. Uh, it's been an exciting day for us already. We've, we've uh, just done a, a big stream, a live stream of a show to, uh, to Port Macquarie, to about 600 students in a, in a glasshouse cinema experience basically of our show which was fantastic filmed on three cameras here in the venue at the Sydney Opera House. Uh, how was that cast? Any comments on that experience of playing to two houses at once? It was fantastic. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd kind of like to see it myself. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. See what it looks like on, in, in, on, on screen. Because they did cool stuff, they edited stuff together. So there yeah. were three different cameras, um, probably like a wide shot, and then there were two focusing on, on mid shots and stuff, and they faded in between stuff, and, yeah, they made it look like it was a movie. Yeah, so I, I want to see uh, the, the movie version. <laughs> we'll have to get you a copy. Look, today what we want to do, guys, is obviously answer as many questions as we can, as quickly as we can, give you a real sort of taste of what it is like to put on a, a production of one of these classic plays, and, and the cast are very articulate. They know the show deeply well. So please, fire in difficult, easy, whatever questions you might want to give us. In terms of that, uh, you can go to the chat bar online and Stephanie here, hello Stephanie, from the Bell Shakespeare Company will relay these questions to us. SMS your friends and family at home and direct them to the Bell Shakespeare website, which is www.bellshakespeare.com.au and they can join us in the, in the conversation directly. Um, if, particularly if you're in Port Macquarie, guys, and you're sure the, the, the live broadcast today, we'd love to hear from you particularly about what that experience was like. Could you hear it all? Could you see it all? What was that, you know, what was it like to watch a play being performed live where you could hear the audience reaction here, uh, but we're in your own venue, etc. So please shoot through any questions to Stephanie if you have them. We've got a couple of questions to kick us off, though. This is from Karen in Yowie Bay, who says, what's it like performing on the Opera House stage? Anyone want to take that question? Uh... You feel, as an actor, very proud um, and quite honoured to, uh, to be able to walk into this, this venue and this national, international icon and then uh, to be able to share a story with uh, these kids. Um, so you feel very privileged as a performer. I think audiences feel kind of privileged coming here too as well. You know what I mean? Like the, to this place. I remember coming here as a kid and stuff and it's quite a thrill to come to Sydney Opera House. It adds a bit of a buzz to it. Anyone else on their impressions of performing here? Oh, yeah, it's the same, similar to what Ed said. It's just um, coming from, you know, uh, being from Adelaide and Perth and, and, and different places. I lived a long time in those cities. And to come to the Sydney Opera House, which is so iconic mm. and so famous, it's kind of like, yeah, sometimes you pinch yourself when you, you mm -hmm. kind of realise. Yeah, yeah. You're walking in at, you know, 8.30 in the morning and looking at the bridge and the, yeah, and the Opera yeah. House and I, and I can't believe that they let me in with my swipe card <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but they do. Yeah. That's good. Every day. Yeah, every day. We have um, another question we have is from Caitlin in Bombala in New South Wales who asks what, uh, what the first production decisions that tend to be made when, when preparing a production are. And I guess, I guess that's a, a question I can answer. The, the, the first thing you do naturally in, in directing one of these plays is study the text really intensely, which is exactly the same thing these guys do when they're preparing to perform in one of these plays. But I guess the first thing is, is, is the design. You know, you, you, you think about how will you tell this story. It's been told 400 million times before, so what are you going to do? to tell this story a bit differently, I suppose. And, and the, as you can see, this particular setting is, is fairly idiosyncratic to this play. It's a, it's a very rural kind of setting in this play, a, a sand pit, very Italianate kind of world of washing above us and, a, and a, an old isolated pier beside a dried up river. So it's quite an unusual approach to the play. So that's, I guess, the first thing you do is sort of work out from the text, from ideas in the play, how you might present th those ideas on the stage. What about you guys? What was the first thing, you know, you're told you're playing Juliet, for example, in a production of Romeo and Juliet, or you're told you're playing Lady Capulet. What, what's the, some of the first things you do as actors to prepare for a, a role? Um, I think, I'm Teresa, am I, uh, as Lady Capulet. I think you, you look at um, what your character knows uh, in, you know, their relationships, um, uh, what their what their function is um, and their journey. So I always like to mark a journey of a character, where they start, where they finish, the information they find, the relationships that they gain or break down throughout throughout the journey, yep. uh, and then try to map that as logically and as truthfully as possible. Is and a, does is the a good does the kind of the set bringing in a set and an, a concept? How does that affect you as an actor? Like, what does that do to you? You've got an idea in your head, then you come in and you hear that this is the world. And what happens to an actor then? 
Oh, well, I mean, it's great knowing that we're going to have this sort of sand and the jetty and the swing and all that kind of stuff, especially because when we first talked about doing Juliet as kind of the tomboy, I just thought that was amazing. And so to be able to kind of play around on the sand, which gives you so much to jump around and uh, it makes you so much more physical as a performer, it totally transforms the way that you look at the character. Juliet isn't skipping out behind beautiful sunlight with some butterflies and a ah <laughs> sound. Couldn't afford you know. it. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't afford it, but uh, <laughs> next time. Um, you know, she's climbing out in the dirt and that yeah. gives so much of a sense of a small town girl who's playing with her older brother or her, you know, uh, cousin, Tybalt, and is one of the boys and that's the way that she's growing up. Yeah, great. Look, I should probably clarify for you, these guys should clarify who they are and who they're playing in the show in case you have any particular questions. Just to remind you to go online to the chat bar. You can ask Stephanie questions live and we'll, they'll be passed on to us on stage. So, do you want to run through quickly who you are and who you're playing? Sure. Uh, hello, um, I'm Hugh and I play Tybalt and uh, the Friar. Hello, uh, my name is Julia Billington. I play Mercutia and also Lady Montague. Hi, I'm Ed. I play uh, Romeo. Hi, I'm Anthony and I play Peter and also Capulet. <laughs> In that order. Hi. I'm Matilda, I play Juliet. Um, like I said, I'm Teresa, I play Lady Capulet and a random servant. <laughs> Hi, I'm Felix, I play uh, Benvolio and Paris. And I'm Suzanne and I play Nurse. Lovely. Now, one of the things that you would have heard there that's probably a little unusual is that we have a female Mercutio who we've changed to Mercutia in this production. And we have a question on that very matter. It's probably one of the main things, I guess, an audience who knows the play and, and students who are studying the play would be dealing with is this idea of this gender change with this quite significant character. And we have a question on that very note from John in Barnum in New South Wales. Barham, sorry, in New South Wales. What do you think, uh, Julia? The female Mercutio, why do you think she has to be so bawdy? It's obviously in the text, but from a female perspective, how do you justify that bawdiness? And is it to get Romeo's attention, for example, or has she, or has she always sort of been one of the boys, in a sense? Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, gosh, I think all of my thoughts and all my work on this play has pretty much been about that. What happens when you make this really iconic male character into a woman? Um, and I think it's, it's great because it does make you ask questions like that. And I think in, in our particular world, Damien, and, and the answers that we've come up with is she's totally one of the boys. That's, that's you know, where she's began. She's most comfortable running around in shorts. Um, but the, the boardiness, I think, is, is something that is a cover. Um, she's, I think the answers that I've come up with is she's incredibly intelligent. She's incredibly dynamic and, and somewhere along the way, um, possibly because of her gender, something her, a door has been slammed in her face, or many doors probably. Um, and so all of her dreams have been crushed. Maybe she wanted to go off to war with the boys and, and fight with them. Maybe she wanted to, you know, finish high school and she hasn't been allowed to in this community because, you know, she's a woman and, you know, what's the point of that or, you know. So um, all of her dreams have been crushed and as a way to retaliate and say, oh, well, stuff you, um, she comes out with this bawdy nature and she says, in your face, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm going to talk about the things that I'm not allowed to talk about. And it only exacerbates, being a female in that equation, it only really exacerbates the same thing a male Mikusha experiences, mm -hmm. those very things, the feeling of being trapped in a, in a community where the brilliant imagination doesn't have a chance to shine and, and, and is crushed by the violence and the staleness and the idleness of this world. So in many ways it only amplifies that, doesn't mm. it? Yeah. Any other perspectives on, on that from other actors in the cast, how it affects you as a character to have a female Mercutio? Yeah, I think it was, it was really interesting and it gave lots of things to the street scenes that um, uh, you get to play around with, with Benvolio and Paris, uh, Benvolio and Paris, Benvolio and Romeo and, um, and Mercutio because it just adds that dynamic of having a, a woman involved with, with two boys as well. And I think, I don't know if we ever spoke about it, but I always feel like in this version that we've got that... Um, it's almost like you've got Romeo feels to me like the, the kind of younger brother and then uh, Benvolio sort of in the middle and then we've got this, this sort of older sister like, yeah. like, like figure who we kind of admire in one way and, and we want to learn things off her as, as a woman um, and maybe have, I don't know if we do or not, or I, Benvolio does, but maybe fall in and out of love with at different times through our teenage years and things like that. So it gave a real kind of life and always on stage I'm always finding little moments where I might, you know, Ben Volio might have a different thought about Makusha than what he had thought yesterday. Yeah. So it gave yeah. a, a really in interesting flavour to do with that. One thing I found, found fascinating was when we got to the fights and it's how do you 
how do you justify uh, um, you've got we've got Tibalt as a return serviceman um, who's very a, a capable soldier and, and a killer and how do you do you justify the well, I guess the courage it takes or the rage it takes from Makushiya being played by a woman when a man picks up that sword you sort of go well of course he's you know it's that dual world yeah. but to have Makushiya pick up that knife it takes on a whole new um, meaning and a whole new story and, and probably a, a richness in their relationship and then also physically to block a fight um, how do you how do you block a fight? We're fighting with, with daggers. Um, how do you block a fight where the, the physical prowess of Tibalt can be uh, combated by, by Makushia, yeah. an untrained sort of... Yeah. Well, I suppose in the text she is trained, but yeah. in our story yeah. perhaps not so much. Um, and that was... Uh, every fight is a story, and that was a fascinating story. And a lot of, I felt a lot of our character and relationships Come from came out fight. of justifying Absolutely, the, yeah, the, the way they fight in this very violent play. Um, the, and it's also for any young actresses out there who might be watching this and want to ask questions, not only about the play, you might have questions about acting generally, or about this craft, this whole, this whole profession, but particularly there is a bit of a desire for, for modern theatre companies to get more women into Shakespeare's plays. Obviously, he couldn't have women on the stage, so I, I personally believe it's, it's an important thing that we make some of these gender changes to get more female voices into Shakespeare. It's just a personal kind of opinion. Stephanie, do we have any other questions? Yes, we certainly do. Bridget wanted to know... Okay, the performance is extremely physical. How do you maintain your energy when performing two shows per day? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Yeah. Who wants to field that one? Go ahead. I think uh, maintaining our energy has been pretty tough because we've had uh, sort of a long season, but uh, doing a great warm-up is definitely a help and making sure we're doing that vocally and physically. And then uh, throughout the show, trying to eat healthily and drink lots of water. That's, that's been one of them. And um, making sure that when we do get injured, if we do, little cuts and abrasions, that we cover them up and, and take care of them. And getting lots of rest as well, getting lots of sleep. And but do you find in many ways just that moment where the lights go down and once you step on, it just sort of does it itself? Do you find that Definitely. You know, it just and kicks in? And we feed off the audience energy yeah. as well as each other's energy as well. If, if somebody else is feeling down, somebody else will pick that up in their eyes and then you start playing and that, yeah. that energy will just feed off each other, so I think that definitely helps. And it's almost like your body gets used to this rhythm. Like, you, you know, when you're doing it, we're doing it, we're in our fourth week now, so every day my body is used to being ready to go and be on stage at 10 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and then have an hour off, you know, for lunch and then you're back up again to be on again. And your body just kind of gets used to it. I mean, by the end of the day, you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, you, you just get in the Max rhythm fit. and you kind of get fit for it, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's good. You look fit, Felix. Oh, thank you. I was, you know, <laughs> go to the gym afterwards as well. Didn't want to miss <laughs> what else do we have, Steph? We've got Lambert from Woi Woi says, Hello, I would like to know, how do you decide what cuts to make? I would find it very hard. I, I must say, I did find that very hard. And trying to take lines off actors once you've given them to them is, <laughs> is a nightmare. Now, look, the, the brief from the Bell Shakespeare Company was to try to put together a, a really abridged 90-minute version of this story that probably plays at about two and a half hours or so if it was uncut, if it were uncut. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a big decision. It's a very plot-driven play. But in essence, I guess what I tried to do, and these guys helped a lot once we got into the rehearsal room, was, was try to keep the purity of the story. I really believe in this story. I think Shakespeare knows what he's doing with the structure of a play. It's a very brilliantly structured story, the way its dramatic ironies play out, the way, the way relationships build and change and transform through the story. So the, the danger is always, well, what, what if I kill that? What if I hurt that, that journey? Naturally, some... some some relationships do get a little bit hurt, but you know, you do recognise which, which sort of the key ones are that carry the meaning of the play, that carry the heart of the play. It's a play that should move us very deeply, I think. And so we tried to, tried to concentrate on, on keeping it pure, keeping the story truthful, keeping the story clear all the way through. But I guess while also trying to, to capture some of the great moments, the balcony scene's largely uncut, the Mercutio Mab speech is, is largely uncut, you need a ball scene, you need five fights, all these things need to be part of the play. Are there any particular areas of the cut that, that you guys find interesting or find ineffective or find effective? Honestly, what's your experience of telling this story now in an, in an abridged version? Um, well, uh, so many people have said that it's short, but I, I understand every character and, you know, thanks to you, Damien, they understand every character, they understand the, the journey, the structure, nothing is lost. Um, I think one of the best things about it is it's a challenge as an actor when your moments are, are cut down and limited and you realise that 
you want to tell the biggest story and the most about your character that you can mm. in all of those moments. So it's the subtleties that you then add to, to flesh that out, yeah. which is the challenge, yeah. which is yeah. great. It's almost like distilling it all into this yeah. like kind of more refined, concentrated moment where you can try and get everything in or yeah. the subtleties. And the four-hander too was, yeah, was exactly. a big one you guys should maybe mention. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So do you want to talk about that? Oh, um, yeah, sure. Um, the, the, the banished thing is, you know, we, that we affectionately call it. Um, and it, it typically plays out as, you know, one scene after another, which, you know, they're, they're pretty much saying this, the same thing, but it's, you know, Nurse and Juliet and, uh, and the friar and, and Romeo. Uh, and then I think it was, was it Damien's amazing idea to... So to somehow bring both of those scenes together, and it's and it somehow just elevated, you know, the heartache and the and the intensity of what you know each of these four characters really are going through. Because it's, I think it's you know pretty big for for Nurse and Friar as well, um, you know, to be talking to these two young people about about what's happened. So, yeah, that I think that and and it's I must say it's one thing that um, people that have seen the show often comment on. It's like I never would have thought to have seen those two scenes, you know, linked together in that way, so... And yeah. we do get, look, we do get very reverent about cutting Shakespeare, you know, because it's, you know, we tend to forget the kind of audience he had, which branched all natures of, of society, you know, and, and was a very noisy place to be at three o'clock in the afternoon in those theatres, and, and he'd often reiterate things two or three times just to get them across to the audience, and we do live in a different world now, and, and it's, you know, his, I reckon when he played, heading up through the countryside during the plague or something, he would have removed the odd bit to keep the show tighter or shorter, and then sometimes at court they would have extend, extended something, so I don't think it's, uh, I don't think there's a biblical text version of a Shakespeare play that we really need to stick to in many But he ways. would have been proud of us, Damo, he would have been proud of us, right? <laughs> I'm serious, would have been proud because he compressed a lot of his own story. He, he turned, he was fundamentally, you know, he knew his theatre. I think he would have been stoked with a cut like this yeah. because he understood that you needed to make it exciting, you needed to make it roll along, you needed to, you know... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he's coming tomorrow, so we'll see what, <laughs> what he thinks. <laughs> what else do we have to OK, Caitlin wants to know, how long does it take to practise on stage before you show it to other people? Ah, interesting question. I want, does you mean in the theatre, perhaps, or the whole rehearsal period? Let's go with the whole rehearsal period. How long does it take to rehearse a play, guys, a Shakespeare play? Um, well, uh, what did we have? Four, we had four weeks of rehearsal, uh, and then a fifth week that is uh, referred to as tech week that you sort of spend in the theatre. Well, we didn't have a full week. I guess we had four weeks of rehearsal and maybe half a week of tech week. Because you've got to come in the theatre and you've got to get used to your set in the theatre and you've got to figure out your lighting states in the theatre. There's only so much you can do in the rehearsal room. When but I suppose... Week, what kind of hours are you talking about? Oh, well, what did we do in tech week? Or just we're, a we're normal rehearsal week. What do you do in a normal rehearsal Oh, so it's, yeah, so our four weeks of, of normal rehearsals were full-time days, to, you know, ten till six. Um, it was four weeks, wasn't it? Saturday. Yeah, Saturday yeah. Week, and a couple of Saturdays. Yeah, that's right. Saturday which Saturday I suppose Saturday. is a... <laughs> Which I suppose is a pretty standard rehearsal period, isn't it? Four or uh, five yeah. weeks would be a luxury these yeah, days. Yeah. But yeah. And it might, this probably seems like a lot of time, but it actually you work pretty frantically to get something ready in that time, funnily mm. enough. In some Russian plays, they'll rehearse for six months or something, you know, which would probably be very tedious, but uh, it, is, it is pretty, pretty, pretty intense. Mm. Who else do we have? OK, we've got lots of questions about the fighting. Ah. Mm. Sally wants to know, do you really hurt each other? <laughs> well, why don't, why don't we take, uh, take the first few punches here from Tybalt, and Benvolio, yes. two camera. Oh, get up, boys. Come on, come on. Yeah. Uh, this now, morning, Damien, you'll be pleased to know I ended up with a mouthful of blood. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Don't tell. Them. Excellent. Nobody ever gets hurt. I refuse to use fake blood in my productions. Um, come on down, you Tibble. Give the microphone away. We're going to do it toward camera here. Now, Tibble's a return serviceman in this play. He's a soldier, so he's a professional fighter. Benvolio is about six years old. <laughs> and, uh, no, Felix just looks that. No, he's a teenager, and uh, he's just a civilian boy in this town. And we begin with a, a fairly brutal little moment where, where, where Tibble unexpectedly... We might take the first line, Tibble says, and smacks him. And I'll get these guys just only a very brief moment, just to play through what they do in this moment. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about what it's like to rehearse a fight up. So, just take it from where you're saying... Um, uh, you're coming in and saying, peace, I hate the word. Peace. Go from there. I hate the word. Throwing your reactions, guys. As I hate hell, all Montagues, and thee! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 Keep going, you really want me to Yeah, keep going, come on. Tibalt. 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 Tibal
Cheap bones! <laughs> so talk to us, boys. Firstly, who, uh, who, who put the fights together and, and what's it like doing a fight on stage? And, and what, are the, what are the concepts you've got to be aware of? Uh, well, we had a, a, every show like this um, has a, a specialist uh, fight choreographer. And on this show, his name is Scotty Witt. Um, and he helped us sort of put the fights together and choreograph the fights. I suppose, first and foremost, the number one thing you want to worry about is that you don't actually hurt each other. Mm. So safety is sort of, yeah, paramount, of course. Yeah. So there's always, like, Scotty was teaching us, you talk about, a lot about um, being in safe distance, mm. being in and out of distance. So you always kind of make sure uh, early on in the rehearsal period that you're at a distance that isn't almost not possible to hit the other person. You're kind of working closer as you get more attuned with your body. Yeah. And then... Yeah. Um, and after safety, you've got to convince the audience that you are hurting each other. Yeah. So you don't want to hurt each other, but you want everybody to think that you are hurting each other. And probably the biggest way to convince everybody that you are hurting each other is those reactions. It's often the person who's getting hit that needs to sell it the most. Oh mm. It almost, you know, I can just do whatever. And if Felix is really selling it, yeah. you know, but there's all sorts of little tricks. So you, the answer to the question is no, you, you never hurt each other, but there's all sorts of little tricks. You there's the reactions. Once in rehearsal, so. There's the, <laughs> there's, there's, there's the naps in one, in one bit where uh, Romeo kicks me in the head. It's actually Felix that makes the nap. It, nap is just a, you know, a word for, or I slap myself to make it sound like uh, I'm punching somebody. Yeah. And you can do the nap on yourself, or the person that's getting hit can do the nap, or somebody on the other side of the stage can do the nap. So all sorts of little tricks. And just yeah. very briefly, Julia, how, how do you, um, how would you describe the fights in this version? What kind of fighting are we doing, and why does it suit this world? Um, it's it's rough and as real and as dirty as we can possibly make it. It's not it's not stylized fencing. Um, there's a lot of moments when it's kind of it's messy and you know we're grabbing other people's limbs and pushing and shoving and and I guess like in a real fight, like if you've ever been unfortunate enough to see schoolboys fight in school, it's messy. It's not clean. There's not clear punches. It's like it's grappling and grabbing. And so we've we've put a lot of that into it. But for those of you that do love the idea that we do actually hurt it, because I know if I was watching at home, I'd love to hear about the moments that we do actually <laughs> hurt each other. So, yeah, I punched Felix in the face once. In that, in that in, bit. In that rehearsal, in that bit we just did. Earlier today, I got... It was my fault, because I bent down too low and Ed's knee hit me in the face and I, ended, I bit my tongue and I was, had a mouthful of blood. What else? We've Looked had really some other good, ones, though. surely. I chipped my tooth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Felix chipped his tooth. Mm -hmm. But that was in a wrestle sorry. bit. But the, 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 I, mean, I guess to, to make sure that doesn't happen, we, we run through the fights every day before, before the show. So well, we're actually doing... Working. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, we're getting better. We're getting better. Uh, you know, well, when you're on sand like that, mistakes are going to happen. Thank you, guys. So as you can see, Scott Witt's probably rolling in his, uh, in his seat back there going, thanks, boys. You just described almost every show you've heard each other. <laughs> Who else do we have to, uh, to talk to, Steph? OK, Eames and Alice both had similar questions about why we've used the clothesline in the set. OK, terrific. Yeah, look, I'll let the cast comment on this too if they like, but the, the essence of the clothesline was, was actually one of the first things we, we thought of. Lucilla Smith, a wonderful set designer, designed this set from NIDA. She's a graduate of NIDA design course. And we talked about the fact that in Italian communities, in European communities, Asian communities, etc., that, that there's a public, a remarkable public thing happens, which is the, the laundering of your life outside, across the public squares. You know, beautiful, reverent statues and icons of Italian life get draped in underwear and stockings and these things, which is just a fantastic human thing that, that we do. And, and we talked about the fact we had an ensemble of only eight actors to play about, you know, in the whole play, there's something like 20 characters, so it's quite a... It's quite a, an achievement to try to get, give a way for actors to do that on stage. And so we talked about how wonderful it could be to have a bit of a backdrop that presents a, a very public kind of life where people are laundering their, their dirty linen or clean linen in public, etc., and allows the actors at any moment to, when they're changing character or even changing the temperature on stage, to remove a garment, throw it on the line, grab another one, etc. But for you guys, is there any particular moments of the show where you kind of find that useful, where you find that annoying, where, you know, anything, any comments on the on the washing from you lot? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. oh. Um, I, I have a point where I actually hang my washing and it's, it, it, it just makes the world very real. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and what I like about it is that, you know, it, it adds to the amount of people that are in our village yes, as does. well. Do you know, there are only eight of us on yeah. stage, but, you know, but there are clearly, you know, there are, there are more people around and it's, it somehow makes 
this space, which is a sandpit, basically quite intimate as mm. well, you know. Yeah. It's nice to have a usable... It's always nice to have a usable set. Yeah. Like, I hide behind it at the beginning and then the fryer takes stuff off it and sues. Uh, am I making sense? It's nice yeah, to have a yeah. set yeah. that you can interact with and use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Well, it starts the first fight. Mm, that's right. And why is that, what is that first fight in this play? Well, I mean, it's kind of an interesting one in terms of setting up the scene, setting up the conflict between uh, the Capulets and the Montagues. There's obviously a lot of inherent comedy in it when you've got the, the two sort of servants coming out in the beginning. But it's also kind of setting up, um, I guess, that world of hatred that needs to be cleared or cleansed or yeah. fixed. And a bunch of... You know, crazed, dumb servants who aren't even Montagues or Capulets start this ball rolling through a chaotic bit of stupidity in the street. Yeah. 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 The very uh, fingertips yeah. of the fight. And so we begin that fight in this production via a group of servants simply trying to hang their washing on a Sunday morning and it all turns ugly. Who else do we have? Okay, Sally wants to know, what do you do when you get the lines wrong during the performance? <laughs> um, well... I, just from I recast <laughs> um, as quickly as I possibly can. I'm sure they've, <laughs> I'm sure they've never got any lines wrong, but, uh, but have you? Yeah, you just speak quicker. <laughs> um, no, oh, when, you, when you drop a line or you get a line wrong, there's always a moment where you go, what did I actually just say? <laughs> and you hope that it makes sense. And if not, um, yeah, you, you, you go into a free fall <laughs> um, and you hope uh, that there's someone around you yeah, to yeah. save you. You're in a free fall of panic and it's this, it's, it's actually a, a moment I'm getting quite familiar with um, <laughs> and comfortable with. Um, but the important thing to do is to, to actually not panic yeah. and um, just relax um, and just pick up where, where you left off. And if you need to go, uh, people stumble over what they're saying all the yeah, time yeah. in real life, yeah, you know. Yeah. And Shakespeare does have this iambic pentamen and a rhythm and his poetry and, and heightened. So sometimes it can stick out, but other times you can also help hide a, you know, a slip line. And sometimes you find you just swap words around or words that have similar meanings for the same words. Um, it depends just to maintain your intention. Exactly. As long yeah. as you maintain your intention. That's what the audience is reading yes. more than the line. I mean, obviously, they're listening to the lines, but just maintain your intention, and that's what they're, you know. Yeah. And it certainly, it wakes everyone else up on stage, it doesn't sure it? Does. It kind of reminds yeah. you that, you're, that this is live and it's a real yeah. living experience, isn't it? Because you can, in running a show over and over again, you can get, you a little bit get in a bit of a rut, you know? And sometimes, even, a, even an actor, even changing the nature of a line can be a wonderful thing for, uh, for the other cast members on stage. Uh, any other interesting stuff yep. we have? Yeah, uh, Miranda says, why did you choose to have red sand? Yeah, that's an interesting question. We, look, we wanted to, um, to... This play is very bound up, particularly in the second half of the 20th century, where a few famous, very famous films, the Zeffirelli and the, and the Lerman film, and a lot of stage productions became... Really, this was one of the plays that really frog-marched Shakespeare into the 20th and 21st century, really modernised and made it very cool, very sexy, very hot. And, and tended to, but with this particular play, the iconography tended to be very, um, very, very industrial and very urban, you know, street gangs and corporate worlds and metallic cities and, and, you know, knife fights in the streets, all that sort of stuff, guns, etc. And I guess I, in starting to direct a play, you've got to think, well, how, you know, how do I tell this a bit differently? But also it struck me that it's about a small community. The Verona Chase was actually writing about was quite a small place in many ways. And, and we wanted to get a, a more rural kind of picture that we thought would be interesting if in this very small town, uh, uh, the, the children, you know, the, all the parents wake up on a Thursday morning to find all their children dead and how that just ricochets and, and destroys the, the entire town, you know, rather than just being a small news piece about a group of dead children in a, in a, in a massive city. This really rocks this town to the core. And so as we talked about that, we thought about the idea of heat in the play. Heat's almost a character in this play, an irritable, dangerous heat, a drought. And we just so started to get images of sort of a Tuscan sand and or uh, a Central Australian hot, dried out community that, that is, lacks water, uh, has lost its, its sense of identity, its sense of soul because of this feud between these people. It's sort of plagued by drought, I suppose. And that's why we thought this sand would have a, a really rich kind of quality. Is there anything else about that, do you think? <laughs> it looks cool. Yeah, we wanted to create a set that the kids wanted to play in, etc. We wanted to get that sort of effect, a and really inviting cool. set. Yeah. Oh, and the reveal. Do you want to talk about the reveal? Yeah, exactly. The reveal of the floor? Oh, yeah. Um, halfway through the show, uh, we've discussed this a lot, and what 
the, gen the general concept of it is, is it starts in a community, in a, in a, a little a town centre where it's quite wide and open and it's a hot day, it's the middle of the day, and slowly as the play progresses, the space gets more and more pressurised and more contained. We go into, we reveal the sand halfway through after the death of, of Tybalt and Mercutia. We sweep away, we come in with shovels and, um, and brooms and we sweep away the sand to reveal a marble chequered floor. Um, which kind of creates this domestic uh, room for the Capulets, which also is then we use for uh, the Friars small little uh, world. And it, it really puts pressure on the characters and the stakes and all, all of the things that are happening. Yeah. Um, and then it ends up, we can use that as the tomb. And then as Juliet is dying, we sweep the, the sand as she takes the potion, we sweep the sand back over her. So yeah, and, and me myself, like working with the sand is, it just creates, when you're just in a black box, Create such texture yeah. and colour. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was also very keen to stain all their houses and bathrooms as badly as I yeah. could when they went home to, uh, to wash the sand off themselves. <laughs> Who else do we have, Steph? Imogen says, how do you create emotions as characters if you've never felt them? Yeah, how do you, you, most of you have never killed someone before or died in a tomb <laughs> or, <laughs> or experienced any form of true love. So... <laughs> How, how do you manipulate your emotions to deal with such big... No, in, in Shakespeare generally, how do you deal with the massive ideas that are, that are in plays like this? Aha. Uh -huh. um, the... Yeah, I guess if you have some frame of reference, it helps. So uh, it's not necessary that uh, you may have never experienced true love, but you certainly have had uh, somebody that you have loved very deeply or... You may never ex have experienced your child dying, but you've had a pet die or a grandparent die or something like that. So stuff like that helps create a frame of reference. But generally, um, emotion to actors is kind of like sweat to athletes. You know, it's kind of, it's not necessarily something that you're going for. What you're going for is your objective. So the whole play is kind of broken down into objectives. So you, uh, you desperately don't want Romeo to go out the door um, to leave to Mantua because you know that if he does, you'll never see him again. And so it's out of trying to get him to desperately stay in the room, but also knowing that he can't stay in the room, that you get kind of upset about it. And uh, I think that's something, when you're fighting really desperately for something, that's something that anybody, no matter what uh, experience you've had, you can relate to that. And empathy as well. Yeah, and empathy, em em empathising for your fellow actors in their position and, and just imagining what it might be like to yeah, be in that position. Yeah, Shakespeare requires a pretty big imagination, doesn't it, you know, Huge. compared to some contemporary takes. It's really quite a big imaginative leap sometimes an actor has to make. Any other comments or thoughts on that? I was just thinking, actually, as you said that, the really interesting thing is, though, that this play was written such a long time mm. ago, yet we can all still today experience these same you know, emotions, these same feelings, and they are just as truthful to us today as they were when it was written. Yeah, so absolutely. it's this really beautiful thing as actors where we, where we get to say, like, f every day we get to acknowledge that, you know, it's, it, it, it's all passed down, yeah. you know. Everyone experiences this at some point. And I just, just the, 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 the language demo. Yeah. I mean, not even the poetry. I'm not even talking about the poetry, but the way that he constructed certain sentences that, it, that is just so evocative. The only one that comes to mind at the moment is when Lady Capulet says, look how our daughter bleeds. Mm. You don't even have to try. Mm. Yeah. There's an image planted in an audience's head straight away. Yeah. There's a mother saying, look how our daughter bleeds. Oh, is it you, dude? Yeah. Oh, it's Daddy Capulet. Sorry, yeah. Look how our daughter, like, she's... He's, he's up to his elbows in his yeah. daughter's blood yeah. without me even trying to inject any emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? And it's not necessarily poetic. It's just he's put that sentence together. He's put bleeds on the end of that sentence on purpose yeah. Yeah. to there's, put it in your head. With it. The actor doesn't have to try nearly as hard. Yeah. Yeah. There's another one that always gets me, and it's just Romeo's died and um, the friar's left and Juliet has just discovered Romeo's body and <clears throat> kisses him... Um, Trying, hoping there'll be some, some poison hanging on his lips, and she just says, thy lips are warm. Yeah, and it yeah. gets you right in there. And uh, I, they, I just find that one of the most incredible pieces of writing to so capture the tragedy of a mm. moment. Mm. Um, so, yeah, sometimes the language... Yeah, I'm under a truly... black piece of cloth at that point in the play, and when Tilly says, you know, that his lips are warm every day, tear, yeah. and you just <laughs> can't help it. You just yeah. can't help it because it's, you know... 
It's just yeah, disagree. a lot changes in this world, but the, these relationships don't, do they? The, the way people behave doesn't particularly change, you know. And uh, just if you if if you are just joining us, I just wanted to say that if you're just joining us, <laughs> um, please go online at the Bell Shakespeare website www.bellshakespeare.com.au and please fire your questions into Stephanie, and she'll pass them on to us. Who else do we have? Okay, Miranda and Angela both asked the same question. What's the significance of the rope? <laughs> Anyone want to take that on before I throw any design thoughts? Any, anyone, any, you guys got any thoughts on that? Yeah. I always have this image of the old tyre swing. Yep. From back in the days where well, there is not much money in this, in this area. There yeah. isn't much fun, but this is the lifeline yeah. or the rope that sort of says it's still... And, and the, the child world of this area yeah. as well. Because yeah. there's the difference definite separation between child world and adult world yes. and this rope definitely sort of says the freedom to to have fun that's i guess precisely what what the thinking was behind it it was about innocence in many ways trying to capture an idea that that you know this is a town where kids should be playing and swinging out over a beautiful river and enjoying themselves despite the ohs council would probably cut the swing down and have that <laughs> but um, it's still a, it's a, it's a symbol of innocence, etc., and freedom and those ideas. And we use it also to ring bells. We use it a range of different ways. Felix used it today to smash a light globe, um, which was helpful. Do you want to swing on it? Um, <laughs> yeah, she yeah, just yeah, put yeah, someone yeah. swinging on it. Yeah. She asks, <laughs> do you want someone to swing on it? This is the first image in the play, is Julia biting her thumb. <laughs> hey. 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 It's a pretty exciting thing to it's do on so the awesome. Opera it's House like stage. It's like a playground. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so we might show you quickly our Spider-Man kiss, uh, Romeo and Juliet's kiss. This, uh, this, there's some indelible images in the history of Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> One is Leonardo DiCaprio flicking his hair off his right eye, and the other is Ed doing this. Um, so up you jump, Ed. This is the balcony scene, a moment from the balcony scene. This tends to <laughs> tend the kids crazy. When, <laughs> good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and we pay about four million dollars every afternoon to the uh, to Paramount Studios for uh, the privilege to the Marvel Comics to, to, for the privilege of doing that. Yeah, the rope is a lot of fun, I must say, to, to use for the actors. I think on stage, it's a it's a pretty rare thing to do on stage to swing out over a river. So it's a, it's a great experience. Who else do we have? Okay, we have Jason asking, how different is performing to a teenage audience compared to an adult one? Oh, good question, Jason. Um, it's, it, it's, it's not that different from a performing perspective no. um, because you're telling a story and it, you, you could be performing to an adult audience that don't know the play. Um, you could be performing to a, a teenage audience that don't know the play. I think the difference was really more in rehearsal and, and knowing that we were going to be <clears throat> telling a story um, to younger people. And so it was, for, in my mind, anyhow, anyway, I was always kind of thinking about what um, I would have enjoyed as a teenager and what would have resonated with me. And the story resonates already so, so much with teenagers, I think, with, you know, young love and, and how it, it, it feels like it's the most important, well, it is the most important thing to you personally and your feelings. And so and that's what I remember feeling when I was a teenager. So I think in rehearsal it was just about making choices that I thought, that, or that we thought that, that, that teenagers would respond to. Yeah. And hopefully they do. And from the, the reactions that we've been getting from audiences, um, you know, everybody laughs in the right moments and, and cries a few times in the right moments, which is it's good fun. And, it, and it's also, I guess the main difference is you can really play with, with the younger audiences maybe more than you can with an adult audience because they're more likely to go, to go with you and, and imaginations are probably a bit bigger than, mm. than, than adults. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that technical. Um. Uh, also, you know, this play is known so well and everyone knows how it finishes. Everyone knows the Titanic sinks. But I think this is a, when you've got student audiences, it's amazing that a percentage of them don't know the end. Yeah, yeah. They don't know that Romeo and Juliet died because we know that every adult audience has probably seen ten versions of it. An adult audience. Um, a lot of the students, you know, you can hear them gasping when they're like, he dies too. Yeah. And you can hear students going, you know, who else dies? You know, there's so yeah, and you and they're they're discovering it in the moment, which as a Shakespeare, as an actor performing Shakespeare is amazing. You know, you get fresh eyes. Fresh eyes are so great. Terrific, Steph. Okay, Joseph asks, what effects did you attempt to convey through your music? 
Yeah, that's interesting. The music all comes as a beautiful uh, score. It's not, not a huge score through the show, but there's two or three songs or themes that run throughout the play, and they're, they're written by, uh, composed by Drew Livingston, who's a fabulous actor and, and composer in, in Sydney. Uh, any comments you guys got, what, particularly starting with, I guess, the, the underscoring that, that comes vocally from the cast, what we were trying to do in terms of having the cast deliver the music? What was that about, do you think, about the small village, etc.? Any thoughts on that, Anthony? Uh, the, the percussive nature that we start in with the, the servants at the beginning, I think um, that goes towards um, uh, making sure that there is that uh, primal element in, in regards to violence and fighting. Yeah. And you create your own sound kind yeah, of thing. And, and sort of the heartbeat yeah, of this okay. town is creating its own, both its own violence but also its own harmony in, in, in some moments. Definitely. And I think that's um, the way it begins. So um, using the set, yeah. and again, it's the interactive nature that we were talking about earlier. Um, really helped to sort of fuel this, this set as well as the, yeah. the story. Yeah. And the sounds are more rustic in general because, it, and it suits everything. It suits uh, the, the fights. Everything is uh, a community with not a lot of money using bits and pieces, using buckets, using old sticks. You know, it, yeah. it fits the entire... And what about the, the kind of ball scene, the, the nature of this village song? What, what does that tell you, Teresa? Um, it's... You know, using just a, an old Italian kind of... I, I mean, I grew up in a, a, a very sort of um, Mediterranean uh, family in a, in a country town, and I know that those sort of songs are in the language, in the body, in the history of a family, and they almost just roll off the end of the tongue, those old sort of songs and, you know, you know the way that the granddad sings it and the way the kids sing it, and, and creating the, the music ourselves m gives it an ent a, a much bigger life to, to yeah. each character. We're sort of in, in the song. It's interesting what you said about the granddad knows it and the, the dad knows it and the kid knows it. It heightens that sense of generational, like everything is passed down yeah. f through the generations. And in yeah, like the feud in terms of this play, like the violence, yeah? I never actually thought of that, and that's a very good response. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Any other notes you have generally for me, Hugh, please? <laughs> please throw them my way. <laughs> Plenty. <laughs> Steph. All right, Damon, we've probably got about time for two more questions. Lovely. All right. Alana asks, was there any romance outside the set? <laughs> Felix and Ed have something to tell us. Yeah. Nothing. Uh, hi, Manya, my beautiful girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing to report. <laughs> uh, other than the, uh, the $11 roast lunch every day at the Opera House Green Room, which is love, um, no. No, these are all professional actors. They're all in relationships. Um, Not all. No. <laughs> 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 is there anyone online Julia? who'd like to ask <laughs> Julia <laughs> out? Um, no, these guys, these guys are having a wonderful year. They're actually touring uh, all, all over the country uh, this year. They, they go into actors at work after, so they split into groups of four and they're, they're taking their show around to schools and into remote communities and running workshops. And so it's, it's been quite beautiful to work. In terms of just a general romance, this group has a wonderful connection together and a really strong kind of foundation of respect in which they work. And it's quite, it was a lovely thing to come into this group and, and work with them. I'm sure by the end of the year, that will have all gone. <laughs> Hey. Okay, last one is for you, Damien, from Dave. When casting a play such as this, what do you look for in your actors? Um, we try not to make mistakes. Uh-oh. And then when you do... <laughs> um, no, look, I guess it's a tricky thing. You are certainly trying to cast particular characters, like particular roles. Every, every play will have certain idiosyncratic demands that the writing is asking from you, etc. But... In, in Shakespeare, the fundamental thing is that, the, the, as these guys have sort of been saying in all these questions, these parts, these relationships are so deeply human that there is not one Romeo and there is not one definitive nurse and there is not one fundamental Capulet that needs to be... Pre if an actor has the imagination and has the, has the engine inside them to deal with these big emotions and has the, the, the skill with language and the understanding, the, it takes a lot of intelligence, I think, to, to act Shakespeare well. And when actors have that kind of nous and that kind of belief, then... It, that's the fundamental thing I guess I look for is can they speak the language? Do they make sense? Because it, it ain't normal English and it is unusual in many ways, but it needs to sound as free and as beautifully communicated as normal English. They should sit out there feeling they understand every word of this if possible, you know? And so you look for actors who have the ability to communicate like that and to, and to also rise up to the really, really vast 
you know, imaginative and emotional challenges of, of, of this work. And so the beautiful thing is watching an actor come in and, and who is not the stereotype you might see in a film for a particular role, but watching what they, what they bring to it when they turn their own heart on and their own brain on with this role. So I, I think that's probably the, the most enjoyable thing. And these guys, you know, do that beautifully. And the funny thing is I reckon I could switch all the roles in this play and still have just as, an, uh, as effective a production because these guys can speak these words and make sense of them. And, and I guess that's, that's my point. Any other comments on that? Generally, uh, I, I just want to say I think it's um, I think it's fabulous that we've got you know Anthony playing Daddy Cap and you know T playing Lady Cap and then Tilly is their daughter mm. and it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. It actually it, it doesn't make a She's difference. Three years younger than me. <laughs> 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 yeah, but it really but you know for for us as as you know fellow ensemble members, you know it doesn't make a difference no. to our storytelling yeah. or to our relationships and. I haven't heard a single yeah. audience member say that that seems odd. Yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't. That's because T looks 54 on stage. That's right. Quite <laughs> 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 right a reply. Uh, yes, right <laughs> Well, I'd like to get some uh, free oil of Olay from the Shakespeare <laughs> Company to combat this. <laughs> Any last questions you got, Steph? Is that it? Maybe we can squeeze one more in. Okay. Ida says, the character of Tybalt is shown very differently here than in the movies. What inspired the way he and Juliet were so close? Oh, what a good question. Um, what inspired the way that, that Tybalt and Juliet were so close? What do you think? It seemed to come out of... I, I don't know. I think, I think it came out of trying to show a family that was close. Um, and all, I mean, we talked a little bit about the difference between the, how Juliet's family is portrayed more than, much more than Romeo's family. You see Romeo with his friends, you see Juliet with her family. So I think we were just trying to create that sort of family fear, so it felt like a real family. But also, in terms of Tybalt, uh, it was exciting for me to be able to sort of highlight that contrast. You know, he comes on with Juliet on his back and he's got the, the skirt on and he's got makeup on his face. And then a few scenes later, well, it, actually, he's already been in the street beating people up. So, it, personally, that was, you know, fun for me to have that much to do in that character. But would that be fair enough to say that we were just trying to sort of create that family sense? Yeah, and I think also to create, um, I guess, sort of that Italian, we talked a little bit about it, the kind of capriciousness of Tybalt, that in one moment he's, you know, that he isn't just... Um, creating the fight all the time, that he is a person who can play with Juliet and can mm. sort of roughhouse with her and also be fighting in the street. And also that he is, even when he is making fun with Juliet, he is kind of creating a feud with Capulet, seeing that how Juliet Well, we had all loves... those elements of that family, didn't we? We had his closeness with Juliet and we had the sort of that wow. generational rivalry with Daddy Capulet. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And the pashing Mama Capulet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks, guys. It's been really wonderful answering all your questions, and thank you to the cast for doing all that. Bill Shakespeare Company, this, this play is here and then moves to Melbourne, and then they're also doing Macbeth, is currently in Canberra, and the School for Wives is about to start rehearsing, and it will tour nationally all over the place. The Duchess of Malfi is about to start rehearsals in, in Sydney, a wonderful non-Shakespeare play that John Bell is directing, opening in, in mid-July. Look, those questions were really fascinating, um, guys, and thank, thank you so much for, for bringing them to us, and thank you, cast. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you.